you'd be well aware of the phrase that climate change is a risk multiplier, and here it's vividly demonstrated in health terms, work that uh, Tony uh, and I think Chris were both involved with about 10 years ago, looking at the estimated burden of disease attributable to climate change in 2000 for a select number of causes down there on the right-hand side. A and you can see that the distribution uh, of the burden is very uneven, that it's carried mostly by countries and populations who already uh, have uh, high rates of preventable disease, morbidity and mortality. A similar point was made by the World Bank in the World Development Report 2010, where they made this comment, uh, that the baseline health status of a country is the single largest determinant of the likely impacts and also the costs of adapting to try and cope with those impacts. Um, from that position, um, it's uh, easy to see how this, this particular uh, point of view could be sustained, um, that effective adaptation will be characterized primarily by investments that reinforce essential public health services. It's a bit difficult to argue with that. Um, and then perhaps it's only a small step from that view to this one, which is uh, that perhaps established practices will be sufficient if only we provide sufficient funding. Or to put it another way, um, what is special about adaptation to climate change? I I'm going to propose four considerations that I want to talk about uh, briefly. One is the, the point of scale, which has been mentioned, I think, by every single speaker this morning. Um, the second point is about the force of change. The third is the phenomenon of emergent risks, which I want to describe in a health point of view. And then um, the point that there may well be silver lining to a dark cloud, that uh, a unique challenge I think is indeed accompanied by some special opportunities. Well, the scale issue, um, I won't dwell on this because I know you're all terribly familiar with this. Um, two aspects to scale. Obviously, uh, climate change acts globally, so adaptation has to take account of distant as well as local effects. And then there's the time issue. Um, it, well demonstrated, of course, by the enormous lags for sea level rise. And I think Chris Eby was just making the argument that, uh, was making the argument just now, that we'd, we don't look far enough to the right-hand side on this graph uh, for obvious and natural reasons, uh, but it's important to appreciate that we are talking about a process that accumulates and progresses um, with such long lag times that's essentially irreversible. Force of change. Um, I found it helpful to appreciate that this is not a one-off event of the kind that we're often dealing with in emergency management and public health, but it's a new dynamic with enormous momentum. As a result, we are likely to be pushed to the edge of what is familiar and beyond. In epidemiological terms, even if the exposures remain the same in the future, it may be difficult to anticipate just what the dose-response relationships will be. This is the phenomenon of tipping points, thresholds, nonlinearities, and so on. And the heat wave in Russia in 2010 uh, is perhaps an illustration of this point. Who knows how many um, excess deaths there were in Russia at that time, maybe 50,000 or more. Certainly many more than would have been expected just on the basis of historic um, temperature mortality relationships. Also, um, colleague Boris Revich is looking at this closely. The causes of death are unexpected, that the increase is right across all causes of death, including conditions like cancer, which one wouldn't normally expect to be related to heat, uh, not as far as we know, anyway. Um, what were the mechanisms? Was it to do with the power outages that disabled the Russian health system, the interruptions in the medical supply chain? Are there biological effects that we just don't know about uh, of extreme heat? So we're over the edge. We're into nonlinearities um, and all the difficulties that go with prediction. 
surprises. Um, you know, climate change doesn't only multiply risk. It may contribute to, to new risks of ecosystems oppressed beyond significant thresholds. Um, and this is very true in the health area. Um, I don't know if any of you can pick this delightful organism here. It's, um, it's one called Vibrio parahemolyticus, the cause of seafood poisoning. It's temperature sensitive. And until 2004, it had never been reported above the um, United States-Canada border. But in that year, there was an outbreak um, of uh, food poisoning caused by this particular bacteria on a cruise ship in Alaska. The cause of the illness uh, it was all traced back to oysters that were taken from a local farm. Uh, when the records at this farm were scrutinized, it was observed that water temperatures at the farm had been rising steadily for a decade and had presumably crossed a critical boundary beyond which this particular organism could be sustained. Well, what does this mean for public health systems? My suggestion is that it's, um, it's an important reminder that it's not enough just to plan for more of the present problems. We also have to take account of the possibility of new kinds of problems. For example, in New Zealand, there are at present no human arboviruses, at least none of significant um, import, and indeed no significant mosquito-borne diseases of other kinds either. But this work here, looking at um, risk mapping for uh, vector receptivity for a, um, a mosquito called Aedes albopictus, um, a potential vector for dengue, shows that in the future, um, vectors and the diseases themselves may very well become established in our country, and this is the kind of step change in risk um, that may be associated with climate change. In a situation like this, it would be prudent for public health authorities to do more than business as usual. Now, I referred to a silver lining. Um, and by this, I meant opportunities for co-benefits, including mitigation. Um, a business as usual approach, for example, one that concentrated solely on health sector improvements and did not engage with broader interventions, would miss some very important opportunities. We know that reducing temperatures in cities will be an important aspect of health adaptation, as might be done simply by relying on aggressive air conditioning of healthcare facilities, for example, which would, of course, carry a heavy cost in terms of power consumption and heat generation. Other approaches, such as what I show in the slide here, uh, expanded wetlands, other city green spaces, can bring a range of benefits in addition to cooling carbon sequestration being one of them. There may be health benefits also, um, secondary to reduced air pollution, better mental health, and more opportunities for physical activity. But I, I put the uh, reference down the bottom right-hand corner of the slide um, just as a reminder that these win-win interventions are seldom straightforward. Green spaces on their own may not be sufficient to earn the health dividend. A recent study of the 49 largest cities in the United States, carried out by Richardson and others, compared the extent of green space with mortality, adjusting for all the important social and demographic differences that you would want to take account of. The result, against expectations, was that health was worse in greener cities. The explanation seems to be that there are other elements of urban renovation that are critical in combination with greening, transport policy and land use regulation in particular. Otherwise, at least in the United States context, the undesirable effects of urban sprawl predominate. Well, is it possible to have our cake and eat it too? Um, possibly, I think the answer is. Uh, but like Chris's question, maybe. We've already heard about the, the heat wave in France in 2003, um, which uh, I think, as Tony said, caused uh, 14,000, 15,000 deaths in one month. And it's an important reminder that even in affluent countries, extremes and variability in climate can have significant uh, damaging effects. But there's some evidence from the same country that adaptation, applying a mix of strategies, 
may be effective, because after 2003, the French invested in a national heatwave plan that had a number of um, components to it. It included the kind of early warning systems that Chris has referred to, improved health surveillance, guidelines for prevention and the treatment of heat-related disease, air conditioning for hospitals and retirement homes, and improvements in primary care. Now, I, I think this is quite an interesting example of um, what was defined earlier before morning tea as effective adaptation, because there's some evidence that what the French did um, achieved Tony's haircut. In other words, it reduced the increment that you might say is due to um, heat, uh, and also had some beneficial consequences that were evident even in the absence of heat. What the slide here shows um, is the, uh, the dotted line that peaks is the mortality that would have been expected on the basis of the temperature mortality relationship observed from 1975 to 2003. So that was the sort of the historic coefficient. Um, and the, the continuous line is what is observed. And so the area between those curves represents the savings. And that uh, amounted to about 4,000 deaths that were, were um, uh, avoided. What's not shown on the graph is that there were also fewer than, expected death, fewer than expected deaths in 2005 and 2004 when the summers were relatively cool. Um, so suggestion that the changes that had been made produced some benefit in terms of lowering the baseline risk for this population. Um, Hess and colleagues, um, United States um, public health uh, specialists, have looked closely at this um, have your cake and eat it approach, uh, recommend their paper. They point out that it's not all plain sailing, that there are um, difficulties in trying to combine the general and the specific. And these first three points, I guess, are um, important but obvious. Um, in terms of um, the choices that have to be made in a short time frame, that it's difficult to avoid discounting future risks. Um, they are important, uh, but as I said, obvious. The, the two um, here I thought I'd spend a little bit more time on uh, because they are to do with scale and the difficulties we have count coping with scale. And I thought I'd talk about them by reference to a country that I've been fortunate to work in recently. Um, Kiribati uh, includes 33 islands dispersed over an enormous area of the Pacific, um, astride the equator. Uh, and what stands out in public health terms um, about Kiribati is, are the conditions on the capital island, South Tarawa, where there are approximately 45,000 people living on a sand spit uh, that's about 300 metres wide and 20 kilometres long. One of the present urgencies uh, that uh, um, is experienced in Kiribati uh, and in South Tarawa in particular is displayed here on this slide, um, the problem of sanitation. About a quarter of the population on South Tarawa use as toilets bush, sea or lagoon. Climate change, and of course, threatens to make this problem worse because the projections are for more days of very heavy rainfall and higher temperatures, and we're well aware of the risks that uh, follow. Following the, the business-as-usual approach to adaptation, there's been a considerable investment in the traditional kinds of technologies, and I, I've shown one of them here on this slide. Now, there are problems. Um, water flush toilets are not the most appropriate choice on a crowded, drought-prone atoll. And in addition, Kiribati, maximum altitude somewhere between two and three metres, faces long-term progressive sea level rise. Investments in housing, coastal protection and waste and water services may buy short-term protection, but conceivably do more harm than good in the long term. In this particular case, there's been erosion, advance of the lagoon edge, and the toilet's been abandoned. An example, perhaps not of effective adaptation, but of maladaptation. 
Well, I want to finish by thinking about um, how we might overcome or at least diminish some of the difficulties that Hess and colleagues in the paper I referred to wrote about. Um, might it, it be a part at least a framing issue? Should we be on the lookout for the right story, local experiences of coping with environmental threats, which might enable people to link present day experiences with what might lie ahead. And I want to talk about an example that's uh, important for us. Um, February the 22nd last year, 185 people were killed in the Christchurch earthquake. Um, more than 100 of those deaths occurred in the building here that's shown on the slide, the Canterbury Television Building, which collapsed and caught fire. And as with uh, the bushfires, and I'm sure with the floods here in Australia, everybody's efforts initially were very much on rescue and secure type activities, but now we're into the rebuild phase, and there are some rather interesting comparisons, I suggest, to make with adaptation to climate change. I didn't know until this morning that uh, your Productivity Commission has visited New Zealand already um, to talk to the people involved with, uh, with this event. Certainly there are differences. I mean, the earthquake is essentially a, a local issue, even though it's caused severe ramifications through the country. But in the extreme case, you know, you could imagine that we would deal with this by simply rebuilding Christchurch somewhere else, seismically inert. Earthquakes like these are discrete events, even though the shaking has certainly lasted much longer than anybody expected on this occasion. Um, climate change has a different dynamic about it. But there are similarities. Um, the need for a risk management framework, one that's not fixated on prediction and attribution, for instance. You know, it's interesting, even with a discrete event like the earthquake, uh, it's become um, apparent that there are large and irreducible uncertainties. For instance, the inability to explain and predict the severity of the aftershocks. Other similarities, the thresholds, tipping points, non-linearity story. This was apparent when buildings that were designed for lesser perturbations crumpled unexpectedly in the February shake. We've also seen firsthand the phenomenon of compounding risks, the cumulative effects of repeated quakes on building integrity, post-quake flooding caused by the combination of particularly heavy rain and a ruined stormwater catchment. And this is an important practical issue. The uh, fragility of the traditional reticulated water and waste system has become very apparent in Christchurch. Um, and the question is, do we need to rethink some public health basics in the light of what we've been through? Perhaps we're thinking we need to invest in more resilient distributed networks rather than a high energy centralized system dependent on a single collector. Again, there are similarities with planning for utilities in a more variable and threatening climate. There are opportunities here for co-benefits from enlightened adaptation, but it's sobering that sometimes the opportunities are not taken. For example, the New Zealand Earthquake Commission banned contractors from retrofitting insulation in the course of post-quake repairs. Any guesses on why they did that? You all bear some responsibility for this. <laughs> um, there seems an obvious efficiency in the bigger scheme of things in a country like New Zealand where we have one and a half million homes that have no insulation or inadequate insulation. The stumbling block, of course, uh, in our case, was the asymmetrical concern about liability. Um, the worry for the Earthquake Commission is accidents and injuries related to the insulation process itself, rather than avoidable illnesses and deaths due to damp, cold homes. Well, to sum up, it's perfectly true that climate change acts principally to aggravate health disadvantage, and I think it follows that improvements in basic health care have to be an important part of adaptation, but on its own, that's not going to be enough. I've tried to outline some good reasons why adaptation needs to be general and specific, and at heart, 
the arguments concerned with the scale and nature of climate change, which does make it unlike almost any other environmental hazard and makes planning for adaptation so difficult. Um, in a recent issue of the London Review of Books, Malcolm Bull, who's a social theorist and art historian from Oxford and who was writing on climate change ethics, put it this way. The peculiarity of climate change is that the seemingly natural relationship of policy to time and certainty is inverted. It's precisely because climate change is so uncertain that we have to consider the possibility that it will bring disaster on a global scale. And it is precisely because its impact is long deferred that we must act decisively now. Thank you.